Good morning and welcome to Greece Public Library's book break for this November 18th. I am Kirstra. I'm a librarian here. I moderate the Pines and Prose book discussion group as well as the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group. And I am here as always with my colleague Claire. Hi, I'm Claire and I do as the page turns book group and also our Facebook historical fiction book group. So and today I think we're just doing like a roundup of books that we've read since last round. And since the last time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, I, uh, I'm gonna start off with a memoir that I, I bought, Green Lights mm. by Matthew McGonaghy. Um, I can blame one of our coworkers, Laura Beth, because she recommended his True Detective series, mm -hmm. which we own on DVD. And so I watched that and I fell into the black hole of Matthew McGonaghy because I was just, I don't know, I kind of associated him with more rom-coms and, mm -hmm. you know, his initial movie start, which was Dazed and Confused, you know, the all right, all right, all right. All right so all right, all right. I decided... <laughs> Let's learn a little bit more about him because he seems mm -hmm. like an interesting character to me. Um, so the king of slacker cool, as I like to think of it, you know, did have his start with the uh, dazed and confused, um, making friends with a director. But um, it was his early life with his parents and upbringing that really interested me. Um, so here you have this person that goes from that type of movie to getting the Academy Award in 2014 mm -hmm. uh, for Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah. And it just, um, just kind of intrigued me. So his parents uh, had a love-hate relationship, married each other three times, divorced twice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he described like some violent fighting scenes uh, to making love on the kitchen floor after they were done, his older <laughs> relationship with his older brothers. Um, his mother entered him into the Little Mr. Texas contest <laughs> and was told every morning, you know, good morning, Little Mr. Texas winner. And come to find <laughs> out, he looked at the photo later and on the thing, he was like runner up. So he calls his mother and was like, <laughs> you didn't tell me I was runner up. She goes, well, why would I have told you that? You know, <laughs> you grew into little Mr. Texas, you know, a winner. Um, so a very unusual kind of funny family, a lot of funny stories. Um, one of the other ones I, I really enjoyed was his brother and he, his brothers are older. He was the youngest. Um, they went to watch the Super Bowl and it was one of the Bills Super Bowls and they were convinced, you know, that they could beat the odds. So they bet all of their money on the Buffalo Bills and then individual stats like Jim Kelly, you know, Bruce Smith getting MVP and we all know how that turned out. So <laughs> that one was kind of funny. Um, he had dreams where he was swimming in the Amazon River and he made it happen. He went off and did that. So um, the other funny one was his mother was selling this mink oil, I believe it is, for the skin. I convinced him to try it. He got horrible acne, had to be put on Accutane. Then his father tried to sue the company for ruining his face. Um, and the, the attorney brought in like one of his yearbooks where he was voted most handsome in his class. So that kind of went out the window. But uh, it sounded like his father was always trying to make a buck. Um, mm. He was once a football player, very big guy. Uh, just really interesting. The whole Texas culture is kind of different. So, um, you know, it goes all the way up to, you know, when he meets his wife and, you know, makes, decides to stop the successful rom-com kind of, mm. you know, stud formula and go with more dramatic and work he's interested in. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Luckily, he had enough money that he could make that decision. So, mm -hmm. um, which is some of the criticism that I've seen from like reviewers that have mm -hmm. looked at the book. But, you know, if you like him or are interested in him, it, it's a fun, quick read. Okay. 
Well, we all know how I feel about a celebrity memoir. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just saying. So. I think you and I have a little weakness for those, but, but it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Nice. Um, so my first book is one that's actually been on my list for quite some time. Um, it is The Book of M by Penn. Oh, that Clifford. one's been on mine too. Yeah. Um, I think I tried to get Pines and Prose to read it a couple of times and without a whole lot of success. Um, so Book of M is um, somewhere between like dystopia and urban fantasy almost. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes place in what is seems like a very near future um, and the sort of disaster at the heart of the book um, is um, shadowlessness. So it all starts in a marketplace in India um, and a man like realizes that he has no shadow anymore um, and he becomes kind of an instant celebrity. People are like studying this phenomenon and trying to figure out what's happening and um, it starts to become clear that once um, his shadow has left, um, he starts losing memories um, and it sort of progresses. Um, so this sort of plague of shadowlessness starts to spread and it doesn't seem like there's really any sort of rhyme or reason as to how or why. Um, this is just one of those things like we have to just take this initial piece on faith, like this is a thing and it happens and then everything goes from there. Um, so shadowlessness, it spreads across the whole world. Um, and it's the same with, with everyone. Once you lose your shadow, you start to forget. Um, and it could be simple things, um, like you forget your address or you forget, um, how money works. And then it starts getting sort of more complex and more sort of central to, um, like people's whole personhood, like um, you forget how to read, you forget um, all kinds of things, like you have the feeling of being hungry, but you have forgotten what you're supposed to do to fix that. Um, so if shadowless people don't have um, kind of a support group around them of people still with shadows, um, they tend to they, they die, like they wander off and forget how to come back, they forget to eat, they forget all of these things. Um, but then the other piece of it is that um, in some ways the forgetting gives people power. Like if you forget that you can't do something, then maybe you can do it. Um, so it's an interesting thought experiment. Um, our main characters are Ori and Max. Um, they're a married couple. Um, and at the beginning of the book, Max has just lost her shadow. Um, so Ori is trying to take care of her. Um, he gives her a tape recorder um, and she uses it to sort of talk to herself. Well, she talks to Ori through the tape recorder, um, trying to sort of hold on to the pieces of her personality and her memories. Um, so Ori comes back from um, like a scavenging trip and Max is gone. So we have sort of two simultaneous um, narratives. So um, Ori is trying to find Max and Max has sort of gone off and I'm not gonna say too much about her motivations or what she's doing because um, I don't wanna spoil. Um, but it turns into um, sort of a massive road trip um, kind of so a lot of people compare this one to station 11 um i don't love that comparison because i i think the central feeling of the two books are very different um but there's like the sort of small groups of travelers moving through a post-apocalyptic landscape that is mm -hmm. similar um so there's also rumors of um a person, we think it might be a person in New Orleans, um, 
no one knows his name. He has lots of different nicknames. One of them is uh, the one who gathers. So you have people sort of making their way to New Orleans to sort of find out what that's about and people avoiding it. So it's, it's a very interesting book. It's interesting world building. Um, there are some plot twists, um, but it, it, it's interesting. It's, you know, a lot about the power of memory. Like what do we lose when we lose our memories? Um, if someone um, loses all of their memories, are they still the same person? Um, so it's interesting. I, um, I liked it. I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really would be an excellent book to talk about with people because there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of interesting themes in there. So. Okay. Yeah. On that note, I'm going to talk about one that I read that was also compared to mm. Station Eleven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey, which isn't that a weird <laughs> thing. Spelled a little differently though. Um, and this one, for those of you that know me pretty well, know how much I love birds. Um, so this book is kind of a futuristic look of what the world will be like when a lot of our wildlife and everything is dying off due to climate change, pollution, you know, our own handling of the planet. Um, so the main character is um, a woman. Now I'm Franny, Franny Stone, who becomes obsessed with Arctic terns. Um, and she's decided that her quest is going to be to follow them and watch their migration, and which could be the last migration at the rate that birds and everything are dying out. Um, the other thing is the seas are pretty depleted, so fishermen are having a really hard time, and she can't find an ethical way to, to make this journey to watch the turns, so she comes across a, a man that's a fishing boat captain, and he wants to have like one last great catch. So these two characters come together in their quest um, because he feels like the birds are going to lead them to fish. Um, and they have to go, of course, much further than any typical journey that he's had, lots of danger. Um, so they're, they're headed really for the Arctic. Um, so she gets on the boat and right away you begin to learn that Franny has secrets that she's not really what she seems. Um, so little by little, interspersed with the chapters of them on the boat looking for the turns, you're learning more and more about her past life. Um, she's writing letters to her husband, you know, telling him about the journey, but yet she never mails them or never sends them. Hmm. Um, you find out that she's been in prison, but you don't know why at first and how she got out. Um, so as, as the journey progresses, you find more and more out. I don't want to give too much away, um, but you can kind of see it coming, uh, what, what, what is going wrong. Um, so she has a pretty traumatic personal history. Her mother abandoned her, she claims. Um, her, her marriage was almost like a, a whirlwind affair. Like she was cleaning at a college and he was a professor and there was like an instantaneous attraction and they married almost immediately. And of course he came from a family with money. Um, so lot, lots, lots there. Um, but mainly it's like a story of survival and mm -hmm. her way of remembering things and trying to figure out what is happening with the natural world. So there's like two mysteries, what's happening with the world and what on earth happened to Franny, you know, to make her the way mm -hmm. she is. Um, it's very melancholy, which this time of year, I really go for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, very raw look at what could happen and how sad it would be if we truly do 
start having massive die-offs uh, with animals, fish, birds. Um, I found it, even though it was a, an entirely different setting, a type of thing, it kind of did remind me of Station Eleven, and if you mm. like that book, I would recommend mm. this book as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's very moving to me, um, and lots of weird, quirky characters, which I always like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And birds. Nice. Another one for my list. Yes. <laughs> no, that sounds good. I, I like... Um, with the arctic setting like i'm assuming cold and kind of bleak i like yeah. that this time of year curl yeah. up by the fire with a book about someplace really cold <laughs> yeah me too yeah nice okay cool um my next book is the water dancer by tanahasi coates um so tanahasi coates this is his first novel He's written uh, several nonfiction books, including Between the World and Me, which is probably his most well-known. Um, but he also, which is probably slightly less well-known, um, wrote a long arc of Black Panther for Marvel. Um, so he's written um, serious essays and he writes um, for several publications. So he has shorter form essays here and there um, and then comic book, and then novel. <laughs> um, so The Water Dancer is historical fiction uh, with a dash of magical realism thrown in. Um, it is set during the time of slavery. Um, our main character is Hiram Walker. He is a slave in Virginia. Um, he is also the son of the owner. Um, so he is, it is basically universally acknowledged that he is the son of the plantation owner, um, the estate owner. Uh, but he is a slave and he is treated as such. Um, and we find out pretty early on um, that Hiram's mother is gone. Um, we assume she's been sold off to another plantation. Um, but he doesn't really remember what has happened. And this happens when he's very young, like six or seven. Um, and he is taken in by one of the other um, enslaved women on the plantation um, who helps to raise him. Um, so the book really takes place between the time that he's about, um, I'd say like 15, 16, and his early 20s, so a space of probably about five years in there, um, as he becomes, um, as he grows into manhood. Um, the magical realism um, is, so it's it's referenced um, on the cover <laughs> and then also right in the, the opening flap, which is that um, Hiram has some kind of power uh, surrounding water um, where he um, essentially moves from one location to another through water. Um, I don't want to get to, I actually think that that whole thing is kind of a MacGuffin almost. Like there, a lot of the book is him trying to understand how to bring this power to bear to help people escape from slavery. Um, but really the point is um, looking at the institution of slavery and breaking it down and the fact that this is the way like this is the extra power that he has to do it is almost incidental um but the big thing that he has to do to sort of reconcile this power within himself is unlock these memories that he has from his childhood so it's really um there's a lot of very interesting um, language and turns of phrase in the book. Like I think um, Ta-Nehisi Coates is a wonderful writer um, and has a great command of language. And one of the things that he really is doing is saying like you, you have to look at the messy parts of life and your life. Like you have to actually reconcile everything in order to move on. Um, 
and I, I wish I had, I was, I listened to this book on audio. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I couldn't like put sticky tabs in the book by some of the really interesting turns of phrase, but there were a few that grabbed me, um, uh, basically to paraphrase poorly, um, face the truth. It's better to face the truth and live in the messy light than to live in obscuring darkness. And um, he really looks at the way that living in that darkness, like um, not allowing yourself to see the whole picture of your life um, really um, infects every everyone mm -hmm. um, that's involved with the institution. Um, so there's also some interesting stuff about the Underground Railroad and how um, the actions of the Underground Railroad look different from below the Mason-Dixon line than they do above it, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and sort of, you know, the different strategies um, that all move towards the same goal of eradicating slavery. So it's definitely an interesting read. Um, an interesting companion piece to Underground Railroad because they both kind of come at the same truth from two different angles. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I highly recommend it. I thought it was great. I thought the audio was excellent um, if you like audio. So yeah. All right. Really liked that one. All right. My last one. Is, is something like you can pretty much finish in a day. It's uh, Sherry LaPena's new, the end of her new thriller. Um, and another coworker kind of recommended this to me, Miss Cheryl, everybody mm. remembers her. And mm -hmm. I think she did a book break with us one time. She so did. Um, I literally read this in a day because it was the type of thing that once you fall into, you just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. So um, it starts with a shocking kind of accusation. Um, there's a, a married couple, Stephanie and Patrick. Uh, he is a famous, not a famous, but a, a well-known architect, has a business partnership, um, fairly recently married, newborn twins. So they are suffering from severe sleep deprivation. Um, but one thing, Stephanie is very happy. She, she loves him, loves the twins, loves her life. Uh, suddenly we have a woman appear on the scene. She comes in for a job interview at Patrick's firm um, and makes, he is very, very unsettled by this woman from the past coming, coming into his life. So you know right away that something something's up here. <laughs> Patrick is not who he seems. Um, and sure enough, uh, the woman, her name is Erica, and she was his former wife's best friend, supposedly. Um, and she meets up with him for drinks and then claims that she is going to reopen the inquest into his first wife. Now, he has not been honest with his current wife. Um, like she knew he was married before and that his wife had died in an accident, but she really knows no details. So mm -hmm. uh, as the book progresses, you're learning more and more about Patrick, um, what he's hidden from his wife. And um, it's not good, like how his first <laughs> wife died and um, <laughs> that there was an insurance policy that was purchased, um, that he was having an affair with said best friend. Um, and his wife was pregnant. So yeah, what? lots of bad, bad things about Patrick. Um, so you have this poor sleep deprived woman who I, I guess it's falling into the uh, unreliable narrator mm -hmm. trope, you know, like trying to reason out, you know, so she's not drunk all the time. She's just so tired. She can't think. Um, so he's insisting he's innocent. But then meanwhile, you start learning more about Erica, who also is a pretty unsavory character. Um, she's very selfish. She starts sleeping with Patrick's new business partner. Um, 
So you don't know whether she's just strictly out for blackmail money. Is this woman actually telling the truth in any of this? Like what really happened? So this book has pretty much all the, the components of a thriller where you have, you know, plot twist, you have a big court hearing because uh, she does reopen the case and there are new, um, it's in a different state. I believe his first wife, they lived in um, Colorado. So now they're in New York, New York State. Um, so yeah, it's the kind of book that you're going to read quickly. You're going to devour just to find out what happens. It ends with a little bit of a up in the air thing, but I was I was quite glad at the ending because uh, you know I didn't really like a lot of any of these characters. So <laughs> that wasn't enough for me to say goodbye. Um, <laughs> But it's entertaining. Like I said, I read it in one mm -hmm. sitting. So if you're looking for just an entertaining thriller, nice. uh, The End of Her by Sherry LaPena. Very cool. I have not read any of her books. I'm not sure I'd have either. This okay. might be my first one, but she definitely has written others. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, my last book is actually another one off of my stack of shame. Oh, look at you go. The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. And now, so we have both referenced Station Eleven today. Um, and Station Eleven is the book that she released previous to this one. So The Glass Hotel is um, her next book after Station Eleven, which has been a few years. I want to say like five or five years, maybe, in between yeah. something like that. And um, a book that we both tried to get our book groups to read unsuccessfully. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Despite our plans. People, if you do nothing else in 2021, read Station 11. I need right. to read and talk to us about it. And talk to me about it. I just yeah. love it so much. Anyway. <laughs> so. Back to um, your regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> indeed. Uh, so The Glass Hotel is, um, it's an interesting book. So the writing style is very similar to Station 11. So there are, um, quite a few different point of view characters. We switch in between them. Um, we also move back and forth in time quite a bit. Um, so like, I actually think this one would be really hard to follow listening to an audio um, without sort of the visual cues of like big breaks between paragraphs to signal that you're sort of changing perspective or changing time. Um, so that's very much the same. As far as plot goes, there's not a lot of plot to this book. Um, what plot there is uh, surrounds um, Vincent. She is more or less our main character. Um, and her husband, not husband, so they're together, they're not married, but they kind of let everyone think that they're married. Um, his name is Jonathan Alkaitis, and he runs a Ponzi scheme. And sort of the main action, as it were, of the book is what happens when the Ponzi scheme falls apart. Um, so we have lots of people affected by money. So money is sort of a theme throughout the book. Uh, Vincent doesn't come from money. Um, so when she's with Jonathan, she actually refers to that life as living in the kingdom of money and talks about how like the the rules of life are just different mm -hmm. in the kingdom of money when you live there. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of how money changes things, how money influences people's decisions. Um, but then there's also just a lot of exploration of um, the choices we make and sometimes regretting those choices and how life would have been different if we had made different choices. Um, so much like Station Eleven, it's just a beautifully written book. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, it's a book that every so often I found myself just stopping and like, just kind of going, huh. And like thinking about a, a particular turn of phrase or um, like a scene that she's set. Um, but again, there's, there's not a lot of plot. So if you are someone who likes a plotty book, this is not the book for you. It'll be frustrating. Um, but it's, it's kind of a, 
a meditative book, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so if you have sort of that contemplative frame of mind um, when you're reading it, um, it's, I think it's, it's very powerful. Um, it's just a different kind of reading experience. Um, but I still highly recommend, um, if you liked Station Eleven the way it's written, you'll like the way this book is written. And there are actually a couple of um, references back and forth between this book and Station Eleven, which was interesting. So if you've read Station Eleven, you'll pick up on a few little Easter eggs, which was, um, which was fun. Oh, that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. but there were some great characters in Station Eleven. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I've got. Right. Well, you've inspired me to read one for my pile of shame. There you go. Because you've really been working on yours. I, uh, I have. I've, I cheated. Like several of mine <laughs> were on my As the Page Turns book list for next year. But I promise that I will at least do one for December. That's all right. I'm throwing I, down the, the gauntlet. There you go. You're challenging yourself. Yeah. Nope, that I did not throw that gauntlet at you. <laughs> um, so I think that's all we have for today. Um, we will be back in December. And I think at some point, probably our, our second book break, we're going to um, do like a year in review um, for 2020 year in books. Um, so that'll be fun. So we will see you all in a couple of weeks. Um, please let us know what you're reading. Um, read Station Eleven so we can stop talking about it. <laughs> yeah. You'll find it's very timely for right now, too. Absolutely. For sure. Um, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>